By the end of the last movie we overcame impossible odds to settle down and then, after a fierce race with our rapidly dwindling starter iron mine, we finally managed to break free and claim a second iron patch, taking the first steps outside of our protected starter area. Now we have solved our iron problem, but soon we will have three times the problem to overcome, with coal, copper and oil running out simultaneously. And it doesn't seem all that obvious how to overcome that. Our struggle is far from over. First we need to do something about the most pressing matter. While we still have 180k coal remaining, it's all concentrated under just 20 or so miners, and the rate of production is becoming insufficient. We've set the priority output to the steam engines, so we will keep power, but soon the furnaces will start running out. So, after solving the iron problem, but with all other resources starting to struggle, it'd be a great time to finally get mining productivity too, as besides making your ore patch yield 10% more, it also boosts the miner's rate of production by another 10%. Also now we're just gonna research all of the red green tags and get them out of our sight. I was afraid to invest in these before we secured the new iron mine, but now we can make a boatload of efficiency modules to reduce power consumption. Not only will it directly help with the coal problem by reducing the power plant's consumption, it will also strongly decrease pollution output of our most dirty machinery. Because currently, with the new iron mine operational, pollution output and thus bite attacks are starting to shoot through the roof. Well, we need to start prospecting for new sources of copper, coal and oil, and preferably also stone and uranium. Actually, one patch of all of those resources are located roughly in the general direction of the iron mine, except for oil. And while you are distracted by these beautiful flaming bastards fending off yet another biter attack, I've designed this very awkwardly looking wall plan, which indeed contains one patch of all the different resources, except for oil. The only viable source of oil which I can see lies isolated in the far south and I'm not ready to venture that far out just for a single resource just yet. So, to solve the oil problem at least for the short term, we're going to need to go with coal liquefaction. In the meantime we produced over 500 efficiency modules ready to be deployed. And we are done living like a scrub. Let's get some true gates in the wall, instead of abusing the deconstruction planner. Especially after the most recent fiasco. The miners are by far the worst polluters of the base. Miners can take three efficiency modules however, reducing their pollution output by a whopping 80%. This alone will have great effect in reducing the number of biters per attack. After placing efficiency modules in all the miners, including those at the main base, you can see we went from 1100 to just 225 pollution per minute, and instead of being in the lead by a 200% margin, the miners have now dropped to the third place behind the boilers and steel furnaces. Now, oil refineries are not that polluting, but they are very power hungry, and efficiency modules also help by cutting the power consumption by 80%. And while pump jacks are not that big of a deal in the overall picture, their isolated location means that efficiency moduling them still helps a lot with the local pollution around the oil fields. We won't stop there though, we're gonna efficiency module the heck out of this base to further reduce power consumption, and thus coal consumption. After efficiency moduling absolutely everything, we decrease power consumption to just 15 megawatts again, and in the process solve the immediate coal crisis. The coal belts are slowly backing up again. And in the meantime, our starter iron mine is fully depleted now. We really just barely made it in time. And new enemy expansions are popping up dangerously nearby again. Now, before the quest for the new iron patch, I chose to forgo the last accessible level of laser speed and damage as they'd cost another 12k iron in research, 
but now we can get them. Even though we put efficiency modules in every polluting machine out there, they are not the only module we need. So a batch of productivity modules and speed modules are in the making. And yes, after calculating just how much iron researching tax actually costs, I probably should have done this hours ago. But better late than never. 8% less science consumption for the low low cost of 48 productivity modules. As the labs don't directly produce pollution themselves, the only additional cost is the increased power usage. This is compensated for manifold though by the decrease in number of science packs needed. Now we are going to properly automate some of the stuff we had temporary setups for before. Sulfuric acid, batteries, blue chips, low density structures, Why? Well, compared to getting to the iron, gaining access to all the other resources inside our planned future walls is going to be much harder. Not only are the biter bases more dense and better interconnected, also the evolution factor is significantly higher now. So we are going to need some level ups as well. Most notably we want the Mark II Roboports inserted in the Mark II Power Armor with its double inventory grid size. And two more upgrades to the bot's flight speed will make all the difference in keeping both us and them out of trouble. For all of this though, we will need a whopping 1200 high tech science packs, which is actually comparable to the minimum amount required to launch a rocket. That means finally we will start to need loads of copper, but guess what? Now the copper mine is unable to keep up, and it's producing less than a yellow belt of copper. And while the efficiency modules postpone the coal problem, we still need to do something about the situation. I'm not happy about using my poor and only oil source for this, but we're out of options. If we run out of coal, we can't make plastics, which means no red chips, no low density structures and no signs. I will need to feed the power plant with solid fuel. To make ourselves feel better, let's stare into our full chests of steel, oh glorious steel! Well, that helps. We're going to go the extra mile to make the productivity module 2 for the yellow science project. Using them in both the yellow science assemblers as in the labs will yield a total productivity bonus of just over 25%. Reducing the required amount of the yellow science pack ingredients by 20%. We are still too poor to give all of our labs the expensive productivity module 2 though, so we'll just restrict the yellow science belt to reach only the 8 labs that do have them. We also make another batch of 200 laser turrets for our next expansion project. As well as a bigger accumulator buffer. The next offense is gonna be a lot more serious. Our tech pace is very slow though and instead of waiting around we can start off by clearing the relatively safe south part. The south contains mostly small isolated expansions and the big nests are located isolated as well so they won't be able to draw help from adjacent nests. The northern section looks far more dangerous. Actually, this may be a mistake. A strong argument can be made for clearing the difficult section first, as with every nest destroyed we push the evolution factor higher, making the next attack ever more difficult.
Anyway, for the first time this game I didn't even break a sweat. That was a total pushover. Then we go in full disrespect mode while planning our walls. The relocated former South Biterville inhabitants will have to be asked to move once again. But we want to welcome little Johnny inside of our walls. What bots, what? You don't have underground belts? I don't have time to come over, you can collect them here yourselves. We expanded the accumulators from 4 and 2 half sloppy clusters to 8 neatly organized clusters. Oh boy, those expanding biters are not wasting any time I tell you. But it's like the 5 minutes rule, right? If it lays on the ground for less than 5 minutes, the dirt has no time to settle on your food. So if we quickly clear those biters, nobody will have known they were there. Well, we won't let that happen again. But a smart player would start building flamethrowers from the other side, where they would be connected to the fuel. Anyway, since flamethrowers only fire to the front, we need to protect their back with some laser turrets, for as long as the other walls are not in place yet. But as we extend the wall north, we had to change our mind about including little Johnny in our base. We would need to burn down too much forest to place the wall up there. We'll align it with the existing wall south of Johnny instead. Something we could have done actually from the very beginning instead of making that weird squiggle. Anyway, after severely stomping several small southern expansions, we can start the southern wall. Which will eventually connect to the oil outpost. For that we will need to push back this large nest a little. Which is not that hard, but a little awkward because I forgot to take cliff explosives. But eventually we connect with the oil outpost. Finally all desired yellow tags have completed, but we don't have enough advanced materials yet to be able to make the power armor mark 2, let alone fill it up with inventory. We need to turn 250 blue chips into level 2 modules though, this is a slow process so we can start off by making those. Another rascal, a bit bigger this time. Let's tickle him a bit with one damage red bullets before we take him out with two simple rockets. Whoa, stylish. As we extend the oil outpost walls north, we get unexpected visitors through the back, demonstrating the flamethrower's weakness as well. I am kind of forced into a corner here, but this is exactly the kind of pickle we can now easily get out of thanks to the extra precaution of researching the rocket launcher earlier. As a temporary solution we'll give each flamethrower a partner to watch its back. Yes, we can finally make the Power Armor Mark II, the second strongest armor in the game. And no matter how clumsily I place my existing gear inside its huge grid, it still looks empty in there. But all of our resources are very low now, especially the important copper has slowed down to a trickle. Hopefully we can get enough to make our required gear.
We also have researched logistics robots, but not for the logistics robots, if that makes any sense. We are not planning to make any logistics robots for a while. Instead, the real benefit is gaining access to the logistics trash slots, which are basically 33 inventory slots before you actually make logistics robots. A nice place to store stuff you might need, but which clutters up your main inventory like crazy. So, while we wait for the copper, we are generously gonna give back some terrain to the biters. We finally get the Mark II Robopods and my power armor is filled up. Let's check the effect under the watchful eye of little Johnny. And while we head out there braver than the brave Sir Robin, the base bots are tasked with deconstructing these now obsolete walls. And those busy boys have made like 6 biter expansions here. It's not too hard to clean up, especially with our new gear, but the long range big worms cause quite some damage. But do you remember what I said about the logistic trash slots? There are also a nice and handy place to hide your repair packs away from the construction bots during combat, so that the bots don't try and kill themselves too hard. With the 6 expansions gone, we can block off the last southern nest so they don't attack us in the back while we push forward. We actually continue this idea out west with a lightly defended anti-biter expansion wall. There is no pollution there yet, so except for the small expansion parties, there should be no big attacks over there. And while the real plan is to turn the wall north here, we temporarily continue west. The placed entities in general perhaps will function as even stronger biter expansion deterrent than the flamethrowers themselves. I'm starting to run out of laser turrets though. I've got over 150 laser turrets tied up to defend the southern flamethrowers from biter backstabbing. So it would really help to be able to reclaim them before we attack the north. But with the north properly defended from new enemy expansions, we can focus on the southern nest first. Well, surprisingly I've learned from my mistakes during the iron expansion era, so I've adjusted the grid of the laser turret blueprint to fit more tightly together, so it forms a nice uninterrupted grid of laser turrets. And my deconstruction planner only deconstructs laser turrets now, so there should be no accidental power cuts. And with no medium or big worms to outrange our turrets, this should be a laid back stomp fest. We keep running out of laser turrets though, which reinforces my last point about needing to reclaim them. But with the inner area fully secured now, we can collect all the southern laser turrets. And we also extend the main base's roboports network out south, to protect the wall which is under pressure from pollution triggered attacks. And now that we command over 350 laser turrets again, we are ready to go to war on the heavily defended Northern Biter bases. 
And our resource deficit is actually helping us. The base is mostly idle again, which gives the steam engines 25 to 30 megawatts of available power to feed the laser turrets and keep the accumulators topped off. The accumulators have been doing work already, as is visible in the left graph. Now let's see if the power generation can keep up during our first serious attack. But first, since the flamethrower defense now needs an inside corner anyway, I spent some additional time to redo the outside corner and straight section blueprints properly. Biters, please excuse me while I brutally lay out my blueprints over your city to illustrate that, no matter which turns you need to make, the blueprint will end up exactly overlapping itself. So let's find the right location on the map to lay down the first inside corner. Of course I forget to stow away my repair packs, which could be a costly mistake if there were any medium or big worms present. Fortunately, also this nest is so close to spawn that it contains only small worms. We keep a keen eye on our accumulators. If they run out, our laser's DPS will be decimated and the biter spawn rate from the nest will quickly overpower and destroy us. So with one gigajoule in the accumulators left, we make a timely retreat in order to allow the steam engines to recharge the accumulators again. We don't need to stand around waiting though, so let's get to work on the wall. It's a long way around to... Wait, those biters have settled right on top of the uranium patch? I sure hope they don't turn into the highly explosive nuclear biters. After building the wall as far up north as we dare, we continue on our stomp fest. And let's introduce another hotkey which we can use in an overpowered way. You can use Ctrl Z as a highly efficient deconstruction tool. It cancels your last build or blueprint action, one at a time. So we can use it to strategically retreat our laser turret advance in reverse order. A certain pattern starts to emerge. We wall to recharge the accumulators. Then we stomp to make space for more wall. Wall and stomp. 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 Wall and This time I didn't forget about the repair packs, and actually let's keep them away from the bots by default. That sounds much safer, yes? Okay, I give in. I wanted the trees to survive one grenade hit early on, but at this point we've stopped using grenades other than to destroy trees, so let's finally get the tree insta-kill upgrade. After some more walling and stomping around the coal outcrop, we figure out the next inside corner to include the copper patch within our area. And then get ready to take out the last big nest inside of our future base. And finally, a proper display of offense. This is how to absolutely no diff physically bulldoze through biter nests. Even though the evolution is terrifyingly high at 80%, without long range worms which can outrange the laser turrets, there is just no counterplay for them. But that also means the difficult fights are still to come.
to celebrate my small victory, I enjoy my new three insta-killing grenades alone in the dark. And here you can clearly see the limits of the strategy. Even a relatively small nest protected by some actual beefy worms can do a lot of damage and even score a kill. It would be very difficult to pull the strategy off against big nests with dozens of long range worms. We decided to wall on straight instead of the planned extreme zigzagging. Meanwhile the uranium biters wake up, but fortunately they don't cause nuclear explosions. At least not yet, uh, I kill the uranium biters off camp to uh, hide the evidence. No no no, just kidding, settling on the uranium has no effect on the biters. Really? I promise. What? N there's no need to look it up on the wiki, come on let's continue. Now, the next fight looks deceivingly trivial, doesn't it? But it's not. We are now in medium worm territory and these guys outrange our laser turrets. So we strategically deal with the easier south section first to reduce enemy spawns rushing in. Anyway, the resistance is crazy high, bots and turrets are falling left and right and the laser turrets shooting like crazy while the accumulators are draining rapidly. But before the accumulators run out, while we did suffer some losses, we came out victoriously. And now we can complete the wall while retaining the required social distance from the biters. Then it's time for the final push. We enthusiastically get started. And promptly run out of substations. Abort mission, abort mission.
Instead of returning to the base to make some more, we scavenge nearby whatever we can find and change up the blueprint a little. Let's go! And it's again a stomp fest, but what did you expect? You can actually see the small worms idly waiting for the next line of laser turrets to come kill them. We finish the wall, but the wall ends in kind of an unfortunate position, where biters can easily approach from the side to push much pressure on the lightly defended corner. So we push out the wall just a little more, so we can find a more right angle junction between the wall and the lake. And with that, we gained access to another instance of all the resources. Even to oil through coal liquefaction, although the coal patch is by far the smallest of the lot, and it will have to double duty as coal and oil. But hey, we have some resources, we have some space, and although we still have a lot of work to do before we can declare world peace, the future is looking bright. Very bright. Extremely bright. <laughs> 